Welcome everybody. Welcome at today's closing keynote speaker. Please give a warm welcome to Christian Halman. Hello. Hello. I feel kind of naked without my laptop. I was like, oh, let's do some live coding. Let's show some stuff. And he's like, no, it's got to go there. Okay. What can I do? Uh, when Bert asked me to talk here, he talk, said about like, oh, we have this 8-bit thing, retro demo thing going on, and uh, can you do something about that? And I was like, yeah, sure, I, I've been all about that, because I've been using Commodore 64s for a long time, and I played games, and I wrote games, and I wrote copy protections, and I removed copy protections, and all the things you do as a child. And uh, these, for example, these fonts here are actually pixeled by me on a Commodore 64. And I'm really happy to see them huge in a thing that looks like a church. It's kind of weird. I also had a problem communicating because uh, the name Bert, every time I talked to him, I, I had the voice of Ernie of Sesame Street in my head. You know, they're like, Bert, why are you angry, Bert? Because you hadn't said your slides yet and these kind of things. It was just weird. It's probably a normal name in the Netherlands, but it's just odd for me. Uh, so who am I? Um, I'm Chris Heilman, I'm code poet on Twitter, so that's where I communicate the most and a lot. Uh, I talk about JavaScript, I talk about machine learning, artificial intelligence, I talk about how to work better together, and I send a lot of pictures of puppies and, and kittens and hedgehogs around, so if you need any of that stuff, that's also a good resource for that. I think it's great that we have Twitter, that we have these communication channels. I also think we abuse them a lot, and we do a lot of stupid things on them, so make sure that we uh, keep these things alive so we can actually talk to each other. But going back to what, we, what we're doing here when it comes to pixels and when it comes to JavaScript, uh, these fonts that you actually saw are part of a generator that I wrote where you can do these cool things to put in your blogs and in tweets and all kind of things. So I ripped about 150 different fonts from different demos on different machines and allowed you to generate them. And then I wrote a long editor editorial how to actually do that, how to use Canvas and JavaScript to, uh, to extract pixels from something and to have a proper pixel look and not the blurry look that normally a browser gives you. And and all the things that I wasted my time on while I should be doing any real jobs. But this is how much I like pixels. So going back from that to what you probably are here for, I wanted to talk to you, especially that this community about JavaScript, because I get the feeling that in the open source PHP content management system community, JavaScript is seen as this dirty thing, as that either that thing that doesn't work or we just put jQuery in there and then everything works and it makes it better, but we don't know what it does but that's okay because everybody has jQuery, right? And I want people to use JavaScript for good, not for evil. Uh, I've written a few JavaScript books. I believed in it from the very beginning. I know it's a weird language, but we've come a long way on the web, and I think we're not giving our users the right experiences they deserve if we don't use JavaScript to actually do something sensible when it can be applied. But let's go back to pixels again. We all know this character, right? If you know it in green and slightly bigger, then you probably have a sibling that's older than you because everybody played Mario and then the, 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 the younger son or daughter had to play basically Luigi because it's not the right thing to do. But do we know why that character actually looks that way and how he became Italian and why he's a plumber? It's all to do with limitations and limitations of technology back then. Because originally red and blue offered the best contrast to the skin, boots, and game background. Because on 8-bit machines, you had a limited amount of colors. You had not the colors that we have right now. You had pre-hard-coded colors in the chipset, so to say. So they had to make sure that everything is a massive contrast. Because uh, not like we have screens today that are super clear. Back then, everything was blurry. So we did every, everything that the pixels weren't visible. And nowadays, it's all like, cool, I can see pixels. This is so retro. Back then, we basically didn't do your job if the pixels were visible. The cap meant there was no need to worry about hairstyle, eyebrows, or forehead. And there were also not enough pixels for waving hair when falling down a hole. So when he fell down, they wanted to make like waves but there weren't any pixels left, so they put a cap on him, so they didn't have to do that. So then they thought, okay, overall cap, it's got to be a plumber. Great, we got all these pipes as well, so now we have a game. Because in Donkey Kong, he wasn't a plumber yet. We didn't know who, what he was. The large nose and the mustache made it possible to avoid a mouth and facial expressions, because that's the amount of pixels you had. There was no way to actually get interim pixels. And 
that's what it was. We designed the thing to the limitations of the hardware. And we're slightly in that space again with IoT and embedded devices and on mobile devices as well. But it was great that we actually found the limitations and became creative in them. I always think uh, limitations are great for creativity. They are a boundary that I can work against and I can start cheating. And we love cheating as humans. We love to break boundaries and make, make things that seem to be impossible in a certain space. That's why limitations are great. Now, the web, on the other hand, is designed by a lack of definition. You cannot control what your end users have in terms of machinery, in terms of browsers, in terms of setup, in terms of ability. You actually have to be able to cater to all of them. And the better you can cater to all of them, the more users you will have. The web was never defined as like, you need a MacBook and a Chrome browser, and you need to be on a fast connection. If you think that's the web, please get off the web and build something else instead because this is not what you do. I travel all the time. I'm on my mobile a lot, of, a lot of times. I'm on hotel room connections, which are hilarious at times. So make sure that you don't get somebody like me who wants to spend money online. You block them out just because you never tested your things in limited environments or undefined environments. So the good thing about the web is that the technologies of the web have that built in. HTML and CSS are fault tolerant. If, some, if you do something wrong, the browser doesn't break. The browser basically tries to do something for you. If you didn't close that p tag, it closes the p tag for you. If you nested a diff inside a span, so a block element inside an inline element, it moves the diff outside of the span and closes it automatically for you. In CSS, if you write a, to a syntax error, it just jumps to the next line and says, like, okay, fine, I didn't understand this, but that's okay okay, you're probably a stupid human, that's fine. In a JavaScript case, this is not as much. And that's why CSS is so wonderfully extensible, because things browsers don't understand, some browsers don't understand, they just skip. Other browsers are totally happy of doing something cool with that. We tried that with prefixes. That was a terrible idea. But in general, if you want to use CSS grids, if you want to use CSS flexbox, if you want to use CSS animations, transitions, go wild. No older browser will show something, but that's OK. Sometimes it's OK to let go of old browsers. Internet Explorer 6 and 7 are retired. Let them go to the woods. Let them go angling. Let them go have fun somewhere else than the web. They're not meant to be there any longer. JavaScript, on the other hand, is all about knives, bees, and foot guns because it's not fault tolerant. As soon as you make one JavaScript mistake, it says, like, I don't play with you anymore. That's it. I'm going to show an error. And I'm going to not do anything anymore. Much like PHP. I love PHP about that. Like, it's like you do something wrong, you know you did something wrong. And the same in JavaScript. But the problem is that it stops every JavaScript, even the others that you try to include, and you made things dependent on each other. So this is not a good idea. So with HTML and CSS, you're relying on the user agent to do the right thing. You're relying on the browser to know what an input type telephone is. You're relying on the browser to know that a CSS animation should not actually be too slow and automatically stop it when the, when the user agent cannot do it any longer. So there's a lot of trust that you have with the browser that is OK because browsers nowadays are much, much better than they used to be. But it feels icky for some developers to not have full control over things. I want to control the frames per second. Good luck. Do you have any other, anything else to do? No, because you actually have no time anymore to do that. So using JavaScript, you have the means to test what you're trying to do succeeded. So you apply something, or you put an if statement around it, and then you do a get, get computed style, for example, and you know that something has been resized to another size. If you just used CSS, you don't know if that happened or not, because there's no feedback mechanism inside CSS. There's always a feedback mechanism in a higher language like JavaScript. Predicting things, though, is tough. If we could predict the future and know what's come and come, we're going to play Lotto and just sit at a beach for the rest of our lives. We wouldn't be working as web developers, right? But this is why we have progressive enhancement. Progressive enhancement, I've been, uh, uh, I've been talking about that for years and years and said, like, this is the right thing to do. Please do it. And uh, it's always quite fun how people think it's such a complex thing. The main concept about progressive enhancement to me is, like, test before you do something. Jump into the river after checking there is no sharks in there. That's probably a good idea. Like the greatest example for that is escalators. Escalators, like these things here, uh, cannot break. They can just become stairs. So you can still reach the other 
okay, okay, I'm finishing, okay? Um, you can still reach the other level, but you're not as comfortable. You're not being moved. You basically have to move yourself. But that's the idea. So when something break, breaks, build on something that already works. So nobody planned an escalator as like, let's make something like an, a lift, like an elevator. They said, like, let's make stairs that move. Cool. What if they don't move? Well, people can still use them as stairs. Think about that when you build anything on the web, and then you have actually one for all users out there. If something goes wrong with your JavaScript, who cares? There's still an interface that works. And you didn't have to think about that interface up front because it was already there. But is this still enough is the question. Is a stair that goes to the other level good enough when people expect jetpacks, when people expect transporters, when people expect not to have to move at all anymore and then go to the gym instead because they don't do stairs anymore? And what does it mean? What is, how much do I have to build on top? Does everything have to have a fallback? Does everything have to work for everybody out there? Or is it OK sometimes to give some functionality only to some people? And this is where dogma comes in, but I'm going to come to that in a second. Some people say JavaScript can't be trusted and can't be turned off, which is totally true. You cannot trust it. But turning off JavaScript becomes harder and harder. It used to be just a tick box somewhere in your preferences. Now you have to go to the developer tools to turn it off, or you have to uh, install an action, uh, an, 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 uh, an extension like Ghostry or something like that to turn it off. So the people that voluntarily turn off JavaScript because of paranoid reasons, or because of security reasons, or because of they hate you, Fine, let them turn it off. But normal end users are not the people that have it turned off. Everybody has JavaScript, and you can do everything with it. It's the positive spin on that. These are people that come from a React background or something like that. Hey, my iPhone has JavaScript. My MacBook has JavaScript. My mom has JavaScript on her iPod. I don't have to think about that anymore. So we can we do everything with it? And this is where dogma comes in. And I think dogma is a very, very bad idea in something as fluent and as open as the web. There is no black and white. There is always shades of gray, more than 50. Let's not go jokes there. We always have to think about the end, the end cases, but also the in-between cases. So yes, JavaScript can be turned off, but this is not something I want to think about. I actually want to think about what happens when JavaScript can be half-loaded or only some of it gets loaded, or some, some user agent, some uh, browser that came with an outdated version of Android says it knows some things but doesn't apply it. These are the things I want to think about. So let's have some story time. A few years, uh, a year ago, we had a competition uh, with a list apart uh, in, when I just joined Microsoft. And they're like, oh, you've got to do something for that. OK, cool, fair enough. Um, it was just inspiring the web with just 10K, so an app or a website or something that is only 10K, including everything on the first load. So only in 10K, you should do something cool to show people that you don't need 1.3 meg of jQuery and fonts before you actually show something. The average website is 2.4 meg. And on a, on a mobile phone, on roaming, that would cost me 26 pounds. This is better be a really, really good website. So we said, like, 10K, let's show people how far web standards have become, what you can do with it. So what I did there was, was uh, I wrote a game. Uh, CSS has, has fixed names, great names like Dark Goldenrod or, uh, uh, or, or something, uh, powder, uh, Peach Puff. You know, sometimes you wonder if it's, a, if it's a, a, a My Little Pony or a color, but these things are in there. So I made this list of all the cool CSS names, and you had to click on a color to say which one it is. So in this case, find the color dark gray, and you had to click on it. And when you clicked on it, everybody was happy, and you got the next set of colors. And if you didn't, then actually your error counter went up, and you only had 20 steps, and then the game was over. So this is what it looked like. So you say, find the color, and you go on an easy level, and then you start clicking it. And it says, like, OK, I've got to find dark gray. No, that color is seashell. No, that color is whatever else. Uh, this is light slate gray. And it's kind of, kind of frustrating, but also quite fun as well. So and when you made mistakes, everything then in the end says, like, game over. You, you found so and so many colors in that amount of moves. You can now share that on Twitter and be successful and get fake internet points to actually make you feel happy. Uh, you can see already I'm doing transitions and animations in CSS here. So there was no jQuery or nothing involved. This is just plain JavaScript, plain CSS, everything the browser does for me. 
So I wrote it on a plane offline and in two hours because my browser has an editor in a tooling editor in there, everything. I used Firefox back then. I still use Firefox a lot. It works on desktop and mobile, independent of input and is responsive. So I used touch, I used keyboard, and I used, uh, used click, so to support all people out there, including pen as well. And all in all, it was less than 8K, with the biggest part being icons to actually show that this is a game that you can put then on your desktop to click on it and start with it. And well done, Chris. So I was very excited about myself, and I'm like, great, I did something amazing there. This is a real patent. If you can look that up, it's great. I love patents. Really moves our market ahead. So here's the source. Uh, of the whole thing uh, in Visual Studio Code. So you can see the whole thing is about, what is it, like 150 lines of code? And that's the JavaScript, all it does. And this gives you all the functionality, gives you the levels, gives you the counting, gives you all the, fun, the, stuff, the fun stuff that the app does. The structure wasn't hard. I have an array of all possible colors. I then get a random cut of n elements, display them as a list, store the name of the color as a data attribute. I then get one item of the list as the color to match. I show that name and say, like, get this color. And I use event delegation and one single event handler uh, on the whole list of colors that I printed out, those batches. And then I know when the, when the browser clicks on it, what, which one I clicked. You don't need an event handler for every single one of those LI elements. And that has been around since 2004, and people still don't do it. I compare the data attribute of the target of the event with the color to match. And then if it's true, I display a new random list. And if it's false, I decrease the possible moves counter. And if there's no more move left, I show game over. And that was that. The only issue I found in PHP when I came from PHP to JavaScript, there's no array rand. And I would have loved array rand. I've written it now, and there's a GitHub repository and all kind of stuff. But we didn't have that functionality. So I had to write a massive function doing an array rand of the array every single time. And I found a few things that, that writing on that plane, I was like, this is cool. Computers and smartphones are powerful. We can do these animations and these beautiful transition things, even on my phone, even on my crappy five-year-old Android. Browsers can do a lot and are open to feedback. So I found a few things in there that weren't working properly in Edge. And I, 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 I'm lucky because I work with the team. But we also have open feedback channels. So if you find a mistake in a browser, tell the browser maker. Don't tell the world. No, we have enough people on Twitter complaining that things in browsers are broken instead of reporting it to the browser maker where they could fix it. Because as a browser maker, I don't have time to go through the whole of Twitter every day and find out where somebody's grumpy. I'd rather actually get a bug report, and all of them are open now, including Apple's. OK, WebKit's. But Apple will eventually get WebKit and do something with that. JavaScript is flexible and has evolved. We've got things like query selector. We've got things like match media. We've got ar array map, array reduce. All these things are in JavaScript now. And you don't need anything like jQuery, Lodash, and all these things any longer. CSS has become amazing. CSS variables, like custom, app, custom properties, they're called. Look into this stuff. This is the coolest shit ever. Uh, together with CSS grids for layout, CSS flexbox, animations, I can do everything bootstrap or miraculous or whatever gave me in the past. And developer tools and browsers give us great debugging and even design capabilities. I wrote that thing in the editor in Firefox most of the time, and then I copied it back to my editor because I'm a tinkerer. So the beauty of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is that it is a packaged system inside the browser. It runs in the same VM. It runs in the same endpoint, which is the browser and not a server. So all is contained in one package. Everything is running on end users' environments. You use what the OS and the hardware gives you. It can be a website or an app, depending on who runs it where. And you wouldn't even need service worker and other things to make this all work offline. Just inlining it in one document means that one document is in the browser, is cached, and works. Of course, the scary thing is you can look at it. But then again, you know, hiding things is impossible. Even APKs can be unzipped and decompiled, and I can find things in there as well. If your security model is security through obscurity, good luck. And then I read the contest guidelines. As a good developer, of course, you deliver the project, and then you talk to the product manager what you actually had to build. 
And there it says that it has to be progressive enhancement and it has to work without JavaScript. <laughs> so I messed up. And then I was like, okay, JavaScript runs on the server. I can use Node.js. I, I can use all kind of cool things to do a universal JavaScript to make it gluten-free and functional and write whatever cool JavaScript for every environment out there. And then I thought, like, sorry, I know PHP. So let's write a PHP version of that game as well, which I didn't do offline at, in a plane, but I did it then at home uh, on my local host. So the new, st more sturdy structure using PHP I wrote, I wrote a PHP API with a name colors as the content. I used array rand to get a cut of that and pick one to match. I write out a list of buttons with the same name and the color as the value, so that way if anybody clicks on the button, my rest uh, uh, parameters will be the name that it was clicked on and the value. And if the color matches the button that was clicked, I get a new list. Simple, right? If the color doesn't match, decrease the amount of moves and show the list again, and then I realized there's a problem. Can you spot it? The state of the game is not maintained anymore because I have to push everything on the rest parameter or in a cookie or in a database or somewhere else because I'm leaving the browser, I'm reloading the page when I click the button because I don't use JavaScript, because JavaScript should be not relied on, so make it work without JavaScript. So as we don't keep the state of the game in the browser, I need to maintain the random array in between reloads. <sighs> the amount is not much, but meta makes sure as soon as something goes onto a REST parameter that people cannot put terrible things in there. This is not about people running uh, like Viagra blocks on your server. That has been passed. Nowadays, it's just using your machine to do, you, to do Bitcoin mining, and out of a sudden, you got a, you got a traffic of like several terabytes, and you have to pay for those. So whatever comes in, don't trust that. Whatever comes out, make it clean. So most of my PHP code was actually forcing whatever comes in into the format that I expected rather than hoping I expected it. And it was this constant vigilance, Harry kind of thing. Like I even had a function called filter out crap for all the things that I wrote out before I wrote, I wrote out my hidden functions anymore. Of course, I should have used a library for that. I should have used a pre-render for that, these kind of things that come with great things like Drupal. But I'm bored. I was bored and I had to write it in 10K. So. It now works without JavaScript. Let's add some progressive enhancement. Add something at the end of it to make it better when JavaScript is available, but still work when JavaScript is not available. So I load the API content with Ajax, and then I repeat the rest of the functionality on the client side, or do a lot of unnecessary server round trips. And server round trips, every time you do an HTTP request, somebody beats a kitten. Make sure that you make as few requests as possible, and you have a fast and, and a great uh, experience for your end users. So the better, sturdier, more webby version is a few lines less, of course, because the, all the array rand stuff happens in the API, and the JavaScript is less to do. It's almost the same amount, though it's like 20 lines less or something like that. It doesn't work offline, unless we also create a different API. So I have to think about that one, what I could do on the PHP side. It does with work with JavaScript disabled. It also allows bad people to inject code unless I've done, every, every, I've done everything right. And you don't want to think about what kind of encoding horrors you can put into REST APIs using Japanese characters, using emoji, using like malfunctioning in, in UTF-8. There's all kind of fun going on there. So how about some heresy for JavaScript environment people and web-loving web people? The JavaScript is not available argument is largely bogus and is holding back the web. If you think about JavaScript being not available and make everything work for everybody only without JavaScript, this is not what we're here for. And the web is becoming boring. We just had a Google I.O., we just had Microsoft Build, we had all the large conferences, and all of them had keynotes about everything but the web. We had like three web talks, and Google had like two web talks, and everything else was machine learning, your robot will clean your house kind of thing, and everything will be fine in the future in your flying car if you connect you to your five laptops. So. We're already past that stage where everybody's like, ooh, the web is woo. So we got to build interfaces that are great and easy to use and not just like, oh, let's make sure everybody will never be locked out. The JavaScript is flaky and will break argument, will never die, though. 
It's a very, very flaky language and a flaky environment, and there's so many things that can go wrong from your server loading the JavaScript to your browser executing it. There can be a, a, an HTTP request in between where some, some wireless puts some ads inside. Some people may think that only on their mobile system you could cut down JavaScript to 400 lines and then it cuts off the rest without talking about it. You can be on a, on a browser like Opera Mini where only 1.2 second of execution is allowed, and if your JavaScript takes takes longer, it just gets removed. There's all kind of great things that can happen there. So we shouldn't be dogmatic about JavaScript being available or not available. We should be just wary about it. We should be paranoid about it and not trust it. So until the first successful load, you have no JavaScript functionality, and that's a fact. So you've got to make sure everything is loaded before it can execute. We call this programming. We get paid for this. You know, we're not getting paid to drink free drinks in the office. We're not getting paid to actually check Facebook in the office. We are paid to write code, and code that actually makes sure that our end users have a great experience using our systems. So when we whine about JavaScript might not be available, tough luck, that's why you get a paycheck. Try to work in a factory for a change, or be a waitress, or do some real life work and wonder why we actually have no right to complain about the cool things that we're doing. I love my job. I love being a programmer and a web developer. We have so many opportunities and we whine about things like JavaScript might not be working when you could use an if statement around something and that's not a problem any longer. Because evolution is happening around us. We're moving from desktop machines to laptops to mobile phones. All the new users of the web are on mobile devices. And this is not here. This is not in the rich, cool countries. This is in the countries with lots and lots of users like India, Africa, Bangladesh. All these places that have bad connectivity uh, but mobile devices, they will never get a fat connectivity in the ground because fiber optic cables cannot be put in those, in those environments. They can't even afford them. But a mobile environment is already happening there. So that means the new error case became much more important than JavaScript is not available. You have to think about other things. So what do you think about mobile interfaces that are very important? Small initial payload. Make that thing show up as quickly as possible because people are on SIM cards where they have to pay for every kilobyte. Form factor supporting content. Don't give it 15 drop-down menus where one fat button should be enough. Think of people with big fingers and small mobile phones. Form factor supporting interfaces and content. Don't display your welcome to this website of where people have to scroll 600 pages before they get to the first interaction. They came to your product to do something, not to look at how beautiful your CEO is. This is not what we go on the web for. Offline flaky connection support. If something goes wrong in the connection, your app should tell the user and say, like, keep going, whatever you put in right now, I sync it later on for you. I'm not, you don't, you're not stuck right now, and I'm not just giving you an empty page and forget everything you just entered. Take an advantage of the power of the end user device. They all have local storage. They all have a camera. They all have SIM cards that you can put data on. They all have a, a voice activation, all kind of cool stuff going on. Avoiding interaction latency. Everything that is more than 300 milliseconds feels weird. And you, people will complain about it and say, like, it, it doesn't feel right when the scrolling is really jaggy. And it's not that they know what the problem is. We know, but they don't care. They just say, like, it feels broken. I don't trust it with my credit card number. And you lost another user. All of this is achievable with HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. But it's much harder, if not impossible, without client-side scripting. You need to do something on the device, the powerful device with local storage and all the cool stuff that the end user has in their control, because then you don't have latency to the server anymore. You don't have any problems in the delivery any longer, which is annoying as the HTML5 revolution promised a move from documents to apps. We had like input types, telephone, input types, all cool, those cool things going on, but it wasn't as sturdy as we thought it would be. There's a great, uh, the problem is that eight years later, after the proposal, a lot, uh, there are many basic support issues. There's a great talk by Monica Dinculescu from Google about the input type. It's like a 45-minute talk about everything that's broken and weird about the input type. And it's a great, great talk. She did a ton of research doing that and had some very interesting insights. I love the one from Filament Group as well, where he used an input type number and said, like, I want to type a number. Now, a number could be a floating point and negative, not only positive integers, right? So 
no mobile device allows you to do that. <laughs> so uh, on top, that's iOS. It doesn't have a negative. Uh, in the middle is Android. It has no floating point. No, uh, and on the bottom is Windows Mobile, which does everything but has no users. <laughs> so input type number, if you need negative or floating points, has an issue. And the bad people of the internet don't stop abusing old technology either. This is a very interesting security hole that all of you have probably in your systems. Now, if I want to have a link and I don't want it to open and replace my app or my, my website, what do I do? I put an a target blank in there, which means it opens it in a new tab or opens it in a new window in really older browsers, so it doesn't go away from my cool service that I spend so much time on, and I want people to stay on my service. Now, that's a security problem, because the page that it opened has full JavaScript access to the opener page, because it's in the same namespace. So you can do a window opener and access all the JavaScript, including your cookies, including all your, your service, uh, your client-side validation from that opened window. So when lolstuff.trustme slash cats is a page that does window opener and reads out the stuff from your page, it can actually inject stuff in your page. And as people are on the other tab, they don't even know it. So you can replace a bank website with a bank site that looks like the other one while they're looking at the cats. And who doesn't want to look at cats? So that's normal behavior for end users. So the way to work around that is to a rel on it called no opener, no referrer. No opener is for Chrome, no referrer uh, and Opera, and no referrer is for Firefox. That's cool. So that works on all the new browsers and makes it, makes it happen, except for all browsers, you should do it in JavaScript. So when you do a window open, you do a window opener equals null, and window location is the URL in the other window. So that way, window opener cannot be accessed by the other document any longer. It's, not, it's just null. So they cannot replace the original URL. At that sandbox is broken. Except for Safari, where you have to listen to the click event and prevent the default browser behavior from opening a new tab, inject a hidden iframe that opens the new tab, then immediately remove the iframe. <laughs> Excellent. There's a JavaScript library called Blank Shield that works, does all that stuff for you. So think about implementing that one. Our solutions have to have excellent error handling. This is the stuff we have to think about. This is what we get paid for. And not instead of automatic tolerance. That's fine. Like I should have written tolerance with two L's like it's supposed to be. And they should be great solutions and not just good enough without breaking. I love this one where somebody like, oh, look at my mobile app. And then it was like one of those. <laughs> and a lot of times you see things like that. You're just like, oh, it's in HTML, so it's not quite as pretty. No, the end user doesn't care what technology you use. Make it as good as possible. Non-defensive coding is a problem. JavaScript error and Safari prevented all mathematical formulas on Wikipedia from rendering. At one time, <laughs> iTunes was completely unavailable because of a JavaScript error, because it's also written in HTML5. There's a culture of let's use whatever until it works. So if something's wrong, we put jQuery in there. If something's wrong, we put Bootstrap in there. Fine. And even in the Node MPN world, we had this uh, because we work on other people's jobs. So NPM had this FS package, which was then taken out by security because FS is built into NPM. It's the file system access to basically allow you to create files, do things, all kind of things. But it was a package called FS. And what the FS package did, it actually just said console log IMFS. Nothing else. But they found over 1,000 products that relied on that input. So when they took it out because of security reasons, 1,000 websites where products broke because they relied on it. Because people rely on random stuff rather than just checking what it really does. So the FS package is a non-functional package. It locks the word IMFS and exits, but 1,000 packages were relying on it. 
And this is not a JavaScript thing. We do that everywhere else. Like a friend of mine had a Laravel project that is uninstallable due to so many failed missing dependencies. All they wanted to do was change some templates because open source products, if they're not loved and not maintained, they fall in disarray and then this kind of stuff happened. And any software that cannot get upgraded is a massive security issue. I love this one in the, uh, in the Spotify office in Stockholm. We have a lot of massive solutions and we keep building more tools to undo what clogs up the web. There's a lot of like, use this build script to undo all the CSS that you haven't used in your product. Use this one to get all the packages out that are not being used in your product. You're like, why don't you just include the package when you need it, rather than including the kitchen sink and then removing it with yet another step. This can only be a developer doing that. You know, instead of taking, the, uh, taking the, the, the two things out and put them together and throw away the switch, he put like a spanner there and then some extra thing on it to keep the button pressed. That's like, let's fix it in the interface rather than in where the bug really happens, which is a broken button. <laughs> Best practices can help with that, but only when they apply to the people who build things and when they solve current issues and needs. When I talk about progressive enhancement on the, at a React event, they're like, what the hell do you want? We heard that for 20 years. We don't want to hear it anymore. We want to do cool new stuff. So what about older browsers? What about uh, uh, old Android browsers, he who must not be named, or Netscape? <laughs> what about extreme environment browsers, like the Silk browser, Puffin, uh, you, uh, you, the U, UX browser, UI browser, and Opera Mini? These are used by millions and millions of people, and you probably never heard of them. These are used to access your, your services, and you never heard of them. These are valid concerns, but they're edge cases, and it shouldn't be used as a punishment scenario. You should not go like, oh, but some people have Opera Mini, so make sure that it looks shit on the newest iPhone. That's not how you actually get new users in the rich environments that we're in as well. What about accessibility? That's always people like, oh my god, JavaScript is not accessible. Please step away from the JavaScript. You're hurting people with disabilities. It's not. A lot of JavaScript functionality on the web is only possible because of JavaScript. Putting an area attribute on something does nothing until JavaScript also does something to talk to the, uh, to the interface, to the operating system, that something changed. So it's not a magic silver bullet to make your thing accessible. Used sensibly, JavaScript is an accessibility benefit, sometimes the only way to make things accessible. Area is not magic. This is something that I wrote that was part of that game, that came out of that game, where I realized if you are a keyboard user and you want to go through like number 18, you have to tap 18 times because browsers don't give you cursor up, cursor down. So I wrote this little JavaScript that allows you to go through it uh, with, a, with a keyboard like this, like normally, and shift tap to go backwards. But I also allowed you to use the arrows by jumping through that array with like n rather than plus one, plus minus one. So now it's much more usable for keyboard users. It's more accessible because I do JavaScript. If JavaScript breaks, you can still tap through it any which, any which way you want. It's more important for us to get a grip on the overall quality of the web and our code so when you see something like ahref javascript void zero instead of a url or using a button it's not javascript's fault it's a bad idea in practice it's probably copy and pasting code from stack overflow i call it sta full stack overflow development you copy and paste change random numbers around and hope nothing breaks and then you get a paycheck but why anybody would ever write href JavaScript void zero is beyond me. We're, we're lazy people. Why do we write so many characters when not using a link would do the same thing? You know, if you click on that thing with, a, with, a, with an enter button or a space bar, it does nothing. You just basically wrote fail with a lot, a lot of characters, where instead you should have used a button for that thing. Instead of bashing bad use of JavaScript, let's embrace and scrutinize new ideas and components and paradigms like functional programming. JavaScript has grown up. E, uh, ES7, ES6, TypeScript is another great idea if you don't want to wait for the standard to, to grow up and, and move up to where we are with TypeScript already. These are great things that are happening right now. There's a very cool thing happening right now, and that is service worker and PWAs. And progressive web apps, I'm all over that. We're all over that in Google, in Mozilla, in Samsung, in, in, in Microsoft, and Apple is looking at it as well. But that, I, could, I gave a lot of talks about that, so we don't have time for that. But in essence, it's making basic apps that are not annoying for your end users. 
You can send somebody a link and they can install the application with that. They don't have to go to a marketplace and enter their credit card details, give a pint of blood, the name of their firstborn, these kind of things, basically what marketplaces ask you to do before you can actually install something. If there's new functionality in your app, you change one file. You don't force the user to download another 50 meg of your application. If there's, uh, if there's something broken in it, people actually can still use it as a website. This is what a PWA is. It's a website that has been alleviated to become an app using functionality that I'm going to cover now quickly. The first thing is an app manifest. So in this case, this was the manifest of my game. You write this manifest and then the, uh, the user agent knows, okay, that's an app, that's not a website. So with that, you get more access to local storage, you get more access to the operating system. In that manifest, you define what you want of the mobile phone and then the end user gets asked, do you want to give access to the camera, do you want to give access to that? So you have a, uh, um, an atomic way of asking for permissions rather than asking for every single permission to make sure, and that's how we get malware on Android. This is being uh, uh, understood by, uh, by browsers on mobile devices, and this is now also being indexed by Bing uh, to realize that this is an app that then goes automatically into the Windows Store that you can say no or yes to if you don't want your app in the Windows Store, but Bing indexes the web and searches for these manifests already uh, and Google will do that as well. In case you don't know Bing, it's a search engine, you can Google for that and then you will get the explanations. <laughs> the service worker is a uh, worker thread uh, on a different thread in the, uh, in the JavaScript engine that does things in the background for you. So once it's been executed once on the first load until JavaScript executes, you can do things before the page shows up. So you can cache new content before the page shows up. You can find new information. You can convert things on the fly when things, uh, before things show up. So in this case, I defined all my uh, icons and my index HTML and my JavaScript and my CSS. Uh, here, the JavaScript min, uh, min JS. So this is now all available offline. Once the service worker kicked in on the second reload of the page, this will now never come from my server anymore until I say so. So instead of relying on browser caching that we used to do in PHP and we used to hope that everything worked, you can name the caches, you can purge them, you can update them, you can create them on the fly, you have full control. It's basically an HTTP proxy written in JavaScript that executes before your page is being loaded. And this is amazingly powerful what you can do with that. So this is the whole code for the service worker and now my application works offline, is installable, becomes an icon on the desktop and when people click it, it's full screen and they don't even know that it has been just 10K of JavaScript in the very beginning. And that can be done for all of your applications. You can, for the environments that support it, cache things by naming them and knowing where the caches are rather than doing it yourself in databases or whatever. Excuse me. It's time to rethink our best practice for the web approach. Create and publish as much content independent of JavaScript as you can. That's still the winner. A blog being relying on JavaScript makes no sense to me. It should be just cached content in your server, fine. JavaScript can make things much more enjoyable. Some things are just not worthwhile to implement without. I wouldn't do that game without, with, 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 without JavaScript nowadays because it's a bloody game. It's like nothing is lost if the thing isn't working. But it, it, uh, once I cached it with Service Worker and everything runs on the machine, I never have that problem of my JavaScript not getting loaded because it comes directly from the mobile phone from my desktop where I run it. Use JavaScript to benefit from the user's hardware. Make sure that you actually use these caching mechanisms. Make sure that people can take photos and upload them rather than having to go through a pick from your gallery kind of thing. Spend more time building great interfaces and less time relying on what is there and can't break. In many cases, it's disappointing. An interface that doesn't break but is 10 steps where it could be a drag and drop is not really helping users nowadays. Benefits of an it's okay to rely on JavaScript approach. You don't rely on automatic fixes. You don't hope the browser does it right. If you remember the input element, if you remember the input type, you know in JavaScript you can control the, uh, the functionality and you can control the look and feel. How much you want to do that and how much you want this to be your job is up to you. Tooling is great. We, de we've de we have detailed insights into what happens when. If you haven't looked at browser tools for a long time, we've got heap analysis. We know memory. We've, uh, if you go to, uh, uh, to website, website, 
webperformance.org, you basically get a whole message of where your app website was slow, how much CPU load, and how much GPU load was going on, where the, the throttles are, where you can make things faster. We take responsibility of the interface. It's our job to make it happen, not hope that it works for everybody and mm, we were, it was out of our control. It's up to you to make sure something shows up, something that makes sense and not something that is beautiful and makes people wait for 10 seconds before they get functionalities. We have full control over what gets loaded when, cached where, and rendered when. And this, this caching has been the missing bit to me on the web. We did a lot of performance stuff in PHP when I worked in Yahoo, but we could never know when the browser was purging because some other website had 10,000 images cached right now. So with this case, I control the caches. I know what goes in where and when. Dangers to be aware of. We shouldn't hide functionality in magical abstractions. So relying on a framework that does everything for you is great, makes you faster, makes you more effective, but it's also a dependency. If, the, if in the future the framework is not maintained anymore, like the Laravel example that he had earlier, you're stuck and you didn't even know how it works. You can't even fix the thing because you don't know what you used. You used magic. Just because we can do everything in JavaScript doesn't mean we have to. We can use it when HTML is not good enough or too broken to rely on. And while the client is powerful, it is also unknown. A lot more can be done on the server and also in JavaScript. So universal JavaScript running server-side and client-side, cool idea. Go with that. Node.js is super powerful and uh, it's now available in different VMs. If you don't want to rely on one JavaScript VM, everything is available. Important considerations independent of what technology you use. If you use PHP, if you use JavaScript, shit happens. Spend more time creating sensible error messaging in fall packs. Spend less time in trying to predict every possible error. If something goes wrong in your application, admit it. Tell the user, it's our fault. You didn't do something wrong. Your data has been stored. It's not being lost. Please reload or do something. Here is what happened. We, we're investigating it for you, so to say. There's nothing worse than interfaces that shame the end user. You did something wrong. Slowness kills. Our solutions must load fast when they are needed and make sure that they fast, they load, the first load is super, super fast and there. Three seconds on a mobile phone mean you, you lost 80% of your users. Three seconds on desktop don't feel like much, but on a mobile device, we always blame the product. Offline and flaky is the norm. Don't rely on fast connections. Security is paramount. A hacked server doesn't help anybody. So make sure that when you can use client-side technologies that only are available on the device and you've got nothing to do with it, great, you can use that, you can rely on that. We have to stop thinking in binaries and consider writing great secure and failure aware solutions using great technology to its strength. That means PHP for some, JavaScript for others. So Mario evolved, and so can the web. That's all I had, so thanks very much. Christian, thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. Um, do we have time for one question? One question, maybe? One question, because we need, we need to spin up. If somebody wants to ask anything to Christian? No? OK. One question over there, Boris. Yeah. Uh, this morning, I gave a talk about the web and Facebook and Twitter articles. And I think I believe these techniques came up because we, as developers, tend to make websites larger, bigger, sticking a lot of JavaScript and images and uh, functionality that, uh, that we do, I think, because we are used to having big screens and less less hardware to develop instead of testing on slow, slow connections and mobile mobile phones. Um, this is kind of the talk. Okay, that's uh, that's exactly what I said. Like we, 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 we use we throw the we throw the kitchen sink at a product uh, to use one little uh, one little handle or something like that. And this is develop developer convenience over end user experience. That's the really big problem that we have nowadays. And this is partly because developers in startups have to deliver much, much more in a shorter amount of time. So we use tools to actually build things as quickly as possible. This is not at all what I'm promoted here. It's exactly the opposite of like, make sure you know what you're using and make sure that you only use what is necessary. AMP and, ins uh, uh, and Facebook instant articles, although they're on the, on the way out to a degree, are to me a, uh, uh, an admittance of defeat. 
We realized we messed up as web developers and publishers of news on the web had to find a different format to make sure the web isn't broken for them. We should be fighting this every single day as developers by not creating shit, by not putting lots of code on the web that shouldn't be there. Yeah. So Christian, thank you very much. If you have any more questions for Christian, please visit them at what we call the bottle and I hope you'll uh, uh, enjoy your stay at the, during the drinks as well.